Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law. For today's case, we have an excess force violation claim. This is the case of Justin Scott versus Officer Gregory White. In this case, we're going to learn that there was some excess force, and we're going to learn what remedies there are. So let's get started with this. In February 2015, White, a sergeant with the Austin Police Department, responded to a 911 call about a suspicious person. Once arrival on the scene, White saw Scott. White asked Scott several questions, such as whether Scott had an identification card and whether he was with anyone else. Scott was generally unresponsive, as he has a right to be. However, when asked whether he had a weapon on him, Scott said no. Fair enough. During this exchange, Scott held a circular object with both hands and his stomach. Okay. According to, let's see, the uh, according to the footnote here, it was an unknown plastic object approximately three to four inches in diameter and a half inch in weight, which may have weighed, weighed approximately a pound. The unknown object was similar in size and shape to that of a coaster used for a drinking glass. So like a small Frisbee? I mean, it could be a small Frisbee, right? That would be roughly a definition of a, of a Frisbee. That's what it sounds suspiciously like, but moving on. After Scott said that he didn't have any weapons on him, White moved to Scott's left side and grabbed Scott's left hand. White did not grab the circular object, which Scott continued to hold with his right hand and stomach. So the Scott was already putting hands on him for no particular reason. White instructed Scott to drop the small, the circular object. In response, Scott moved his right hand from his stomach down to his right side, continuing to hold on to the object. The video, and there's video, so that's always a plus. The video does not depict Scott actively resisting White holding on his left hand. It's at this point that White hit Scott's head or neck from behind, grabbed his abdomen with both hands from behind, and pushed him onto the ground and rolled on top of him. Okay, so we, we've got a person holding a small object in Austin, so I'm going to assume it's a frisbee and I'm going to assume it's a hippie. Because, you know, that sounds plausible. And this person is coming up and asking questions, and he's not answering any questions because he doesn't have to. You know, this person doesn't have to answer any questions. You don't have to answer any questions to the police when you're not under arrest, and you don't have to answer them if you are under arrest. They ask if he has weapons, and he says no, but he's holding a small object. And then the police decide to, like, put hands on him and throw him to the ground for no reason. I guess disrespect a cop or something, but, you know, that's not a crime. So, but, yeah, that's there. there's that. Once on the ground, Scott twisted and turned underneath White as White repeatedly punched, elbowed, and needs Scott. Again, seems a little excessive. Con to, to no threat. Contemporaneously, Scott covered his head with his hands, screamed at times, curled his legs inward. Meanwhile, re White repeatedly instructed Scott to put his hands behind his back. White then held Scott down and tasered him. As he's being tasered, Scott moved his hands onto White's left arm. Afterwards, White continued hitting Scott. White then said, let go of my taser which is not clear he was holding onto it, but okay, punched Scott repeatedly, rolled Scott back onto his stomach, and then resumed punching him as he screamed. Later, White told another officer who was at the scene that he got tased, and Scott took my taser from me and tased me. I bet that didn't happen. White repeated, put your hands behind your back several times, and Scott said, I can't, which, you know, seems plausible. If you're on the sky on top of the ground, probably he couldn't, yeah. White then put his whole body on top of Scott and remained on Scott until other officers arrived. White's use of force on Scott on the ground is white subsequent use of force. So that's just a lot of force by this police officer. That's that's super fun. After at the hospital after the incident, Scott, our guy who was doing nothing wrong, Scott was diagnosed with a facial abrasion and a head contusion. So all things considered not too worse for wear, but still like why, you know, because, you know, that's none of this is necessary in any reason. White enters three issues on appeal. Whether the district court erred in relying on unsupported allegations and events outside the summary judgment record, holding that the physical injuries are not categorically de minimis, and holding that White was not entitled to qualified immunity at the summary judgment stage, which we hold each in turn. So the district court said no qualified immunity. So that's encouraging. So we're going to have to figure out what the court of appeals has to say. And one of the other arguments from the cop, the cop was it was de minimis. So that's cute. One of the other officers said, well, even if I violate his rights, I didn't violate them very much. And so it was de minimis violation, so it doesn't really count. And the district court said, no, it kind of really counts. And so he's saying, well, I should have had qualified immunity. And also, it didn't really matter because it wasn't that bad. You know, so he should be grateful or something. I don't know. But yeah, that's the district court said no. So let's see what the court of appeals says about those things. The district court has correctly determined that disputes of material fact exist that preclude summary judgment. 
The district court considered the totality of the circumstances, construed the events in the light most favorable to Scott, and viewed Scott's version of the events as a reasonable officer on the scene would have correctly hold that a reasonable jury could determine that White's use of force was objectively unreasonable and therefore in violation of the Fourth Amendment to be free from excess force. The video evidence does not utterly discredit Scott's allegations regarding the initial and subsequent use of force and such that no reasonable jury could have believed Scott. Further, the district court correctly determined that the clearly established law at the time prohibited the use of force given the circumstances and construing the evidence in the light most favorable to Scott, who was doing nothing wrong. Quoting from the relevant case law, Hanks v. Rogers, the clearly established law as of February 2013, excess force is established when an officer abruptly resorts to overwhelming physical force rather than continuing verbal negotiations with an individual who poses no immediate threat or flight and who engages in at most passive resistance. So therefore, it was in violation of the law. For these reasons, we dismiss the appeal for want of jurisdiction. So go back to district court and argue about those issues at trial. That should be fun. So that is the end of the case of Justin Scott versus Officer Gregory White. In this case, we learned that Justin Scott was not really doing anything wrong, uh, was ignoring the police as he has every right to do, and then the officer decided to throw him to the ground, I guess because he wasn't answering questions, not that he had to. And uh, the officers didn't want to be sued, and now he's being sued. And so he has to go back to trial and see what happens next. So we'll see what happens, and that's the end of the coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this channel, and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.